Hello. Welcome to the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at SOAS. My name is Desmond Chan, and I teach on various courses in Chinese culture and history, and also classical Chinese and a bit of modern Chinese language as well. Thanks for your interest in our department. As you know, we offer a wide range of courses on the languages and cultures of East Asia. And I will just give you a taster of one of these um, on East Asian culture today. The module is called Myths, Legends and Folkways of East Asia and is currently offered to um, undergraduate and postgraduate students. Now, as with many <clears throat> countries, regions of the world with uh, long and rich uh, traditions, myths are an important part of East Asian culture, both as it was in the past, for, for centuries, um, over a millennium in some cases, particular myths arose and evolved and spread and also in a number of cases into the present, into modern East Asia. Now you may know some examples of these myths, some particular figures may come to mind, or some stories um, that you may have seen on uh, TV, um, in movies, uh, or on just wider um, popular culture. So maybe these will be some that I will introduce today. So in our module, there we take a particular um, approach, a thematic approach, um, that covers three major themes um, in China, Japan, and Korean myths. And for each week, we have um, a focus on one of these themes and one of these countries. And each country area, uh, the themes for that country are taught by a specialist, um, a scholar who works on that um, region, that tradition. So I teach the China part for this course, but for all of these um, readings or these weeks, we read both primary texts, that is writings that were created or put down in the period of the past that were exploring together, as well as modern scholarship, that is secondary sources or essays, articles, books written by modern scholars, helping us to understand those myths from the past. So the three themes are sacred, sacred geographies, animals in mythology, and ghosts and the underworld. For China, for the theme of sacred geographies, we introduce and look at a range of key sites, and these include mountains, firstly, and on the lower right uh, picture on this slide is Taishan, which is arguably the most important uh, sacred mountain in China, going back to early uh, or indeed pre-imperial times. And among other things, it was associated with the underworld, but also various um, gods uh, and deities that could be found and encountered there. Caves were often places that were seen to connect to other worlds as well, partly by virtue of going deep into the ground, uh, and there were whole um, structures or projected structures of how these caves or caverns connected in, um, to kind of immortals, um, immortal lands of the Taoists. Uh, and after Buddhism comes to China, and there's a lot of inter, um, interactions between Buddhism and Taoism, these were often sites of um, where Buddhist uh, power was projected, for example, in the form of Buddhist carvings, like in this these caves um, outside Hangzhou in the lower 
left. And Buddhist sculptures generally were created to establish um, merit or good karma for those um, who paid for them as a way of spreading the Buddhist teachings, the words of the Buddha. Um, other layers of sacred places as in China include like immortals, like in this Han Dynasty relief in the top here, um, the famous uh, Queen Mother of the West, who was believed to um, reside in the West, that's why she's called that, um, and grants immortality either um, to those who came to um, meet her or through the elixir of life. Uh, and that was a goal of Taoists from the beginning, that is to um, live as long as um, heaven and earth, as it was sometimes put. And these um, immortals were places that are often found uh, in worlds beyond our world, the human world, and sometimes beyond mountains, sometimes in islands of the sea, sometimes in caves and caverns, or sometimes uh, beyond uh, springs or uh, springs in mountains, for example, um, just like in the uh, movie Shang-Chi, uh, and you might recognize this creature from the that recent uh, Marvel uh, Universe movie, and it is in fact based on a creature uh, depicted here in the Qing Dynasty um, book print from these like worlds beyond uh, or sacred worlds, sacred spaces. So for this unit, we read one of the most important texts, the Shanghai Jing, um, which describes many uh, wonderful places, mount uh, including many mountains and the creatures to be found um, therein. The second theme is uh, animals in Chinese myths. And um, it's important to bear in mind or, or to think through, not just in case of China or East Asia, but um, uh, other cultures and indeed um, not just in myth, but in our world today. What exactly is an animal? How is an animal different from a human being? And these are questions which, you know, we talk about from the perspective of evolution, from the perspective of science, but from the perspective of, you know, whether we should eat uh, meat and things like that. But in China, or in the East Asian tradition, the idea that all creatures or beings, indeed even inanimate, uh, uh, ob not exactly objects, but inanimate, what we might consider inanimate um, uh, phenomena, like mountains or even um, storms or weather phenomena, constituted by qi, qi, vapor or energy or breath, the vital force that constitutes everything in the universe um, and coalescing to various degrees of refinedness or density to um, produce the myriad of um, or beings, including humans, including animals. So the fact that, or the understanding that different creatures, different phenomena are constituted by qi also explains why in East Asian, East Asian thought, it was possible for one kind of being to transform into another. So this idea of um, transformation between different creatures um, was very important in the East Asian tradition. And even before the idea of chi was fully developed in that sense, the possibility that humans, that uh, uh, human beings could share characteristics with animals was very important. So this uh, another hand dynasty relief and in the upper, upper right here of the legendary um, couple, um, civilizational um, creators, Fu Xi and Yu Hua, who are part human, the upper bodies and the lower bodies are serpents. So they're sort of hybrid animals, humans. And this idea of hybridity was very important. And feeds into the later idea of what was an animal, what was a chi, what was a creature that can transform between these categories. Uh, 
other famous creatures, of course, the dragons uh, is one of the most potent, uh, especially uh, imperial symbols in Chinese um, myth and legend. And the nine-tailed fox uh, in the bottom right here. Foxes generally uh, their allure uh, as fox spirits, often turning into um, extremely beautiful uh, women, uh, enchantresses, seductresses from Fatal. Um, and that is a powerful myth that spread across East Asia that continues through to the present. And for this unit for China, we read um, about one of the most famous animals in Chinese history, perhaps, or Chinese mythology, that is monkey, the hero of the uh, COG, one of the four Ming dynasty classics of literature. Uh, and the final theme is the afterlife, uh, or souls and the underworld bureaucracy in the case of China. And of course, what happens when we die is a very important theme in all of myth. And in the case of China, we can see that there were early ideas going back as far as we have records of about um, the deceased becoming ancestors um, that might have influence over their living descendants, over um, the human world, the mortal world, and also beliefs that somehow it was possible to become, to prolong life or to become immortal. So we mentioned the Taoists a short while ago and the Queen Mother of the West. But for example, for from other archaeological evidence, like this um, jade burial suit, which is, um, there's quite a few um, um, being discovered from the Han Dynasty, obviously from the elite classes. And these are um, the, the remains, the corpses of the dead covered in suits made up of hundreds of pieces of jade threaded together by gold, often or silver um, um, thread. And this, the purity of the jade was meant to preserve the body. Of course, it didn't work and they were often stolen by um, tomb raiders. But nonetheless, there was that these beliefs from early China. But it was with Buddhism, the arrival of Buddhism in the, in the around the beginning of the common era in the Han Dynasty, that completely transformed Chinese ideas about the underworld. This is partly, of course, because Buddhism believes in reincarnation and rebirth through many, many countless lifetimes, not just in human form, not just in animal form, but other um, deities, um, demons, um, different categories of creatures. And this was partly to do with the workings of karma, um, of merit and demerit accumulated in a lifetime, across lifetimes, which would influence the rebirth of um, in, in the next lifetime. So in this um, picture in the lower right, uh, sorry, in the lower left, you see this, um, the dead coming to be judged by one of the kings of hell and being shown a karmic mirror. So that shows what they've done in life would determine what their next rebirth will be. And is, it is this kind of idea, um, mostly from Buddhism, but there's other um, traditions um, possibly uh, in this newly envisaged underworld system that is of being judged by in various courts in the afterworld, uh, that really um, takes off and becomes the popular view of the afterlife in China and um, to an extent in, in Korea and Japan um, as well, although with differences. So Buddhist, um, this famous um, um, monk Mulian, Madhgalyayana, oh, sorry, um, going to rescue his uh, mother in the underworld. This is a very famous story um, in this popular imagination and demons coming to um, um, grab one, uh, to drag one, grab and drag one into the underworld for punishment at the moment of death. So for this um, unit, we look at scrolls from the 19th century, which are very much um, at the, um, show the mature development of these ideas about the um, underworld and visual form um, in the case of um, um, China. So those are the three main themes and just a few um, tasters, ideas about how we think about them, these key elements of myth.
and legend uh, in the case of China. But as I said at the start, perhaps you know some of this um, already, or you have ideas about East Asian myth. And indeed, it's not just East Asian now. One could argue that some of these myths that originate and evolve in East Asia have now spread across the world. So just to give a couple of examples, I mentioned in relation to the uh, role of animals in myths, the famous story of monkey from Journey to the West. And this was a myth, uh, you could call it um, a legend, but a sort of with many mythic elements that actually go back to the legend or the legendarized version of an actual uh, historical figure. Uh, Tang Xuanzang, uh, who's in a Japanese picture on the on the left here, who was actually a, a monk in the Tang Dynasty China, who went to India to seek um, Buddhist scriptures, which he brought back after almost 20 years and spent uh, many years translating them into Chinese to um, spread Buddhism in China. And that was the kernel, the historical account at the core of what becomes Journey to the West, CLG, and the form, the fully fledged form that we usually read it was from the um, 16th century, from the late Ming Dynasty, but it evolved from you know um, over about a thousand years up until that point, and continues to today. So you know the story of monkey, and uh, you can see in this upper right the um, uh, Japanese 1978 TV version of the story, which was actually on uh, on Channel Four in England in the 1980s. This monkey in the middle, and then Pixie on the right, and uh, who's a kind of fallen deity in the form of a pig, and Sandy on the left, similarly uh, a fallen deity. So these brothers, um, fellow um, students or disciples of the the uh, Tang Xuanzang or the fictionalized version of Tang Xuanzang, Tripitaka, um, go on their many, many adventures um, westwards to fetch scriptures, just like the original historical figure had done. The, um, this became, uh, this is, story has been told and retold many times, as you can see in Japan, in China, including in the communist period, it was one of um, the few or the major um, officially approved animated films in China, even in the Maoist period, um, and continues to be told in modern versions today, like in this kind of comedy one, comedy version from 2013 in the lower right. Uh, spreading uh, across East Asia, we already said it, is popular in um, Japan, but you may or may not know that some of the um, very, um, very popular representations of it may be found in uh, Dragon Ball, that wonderful um, manga uh, TV series that began in the 1980s, the main character, Goku, um, was in fact uh, informed in part by Monkey. You can see his monkey tail in this um, early depiction of him, uh, the boy version of Goku. And then, then this uh, uh, as recent um, reality TV show from Korea, New Journey to the Re West, um, has the characters. It's been going on for multiple seasons. I haven't seen it myself, but it's a great hit. It's very popular. Uh, has characters... Um, dressed up as, uh, as a contestants, dressed up as characters from Journey to the West. And their quest is to um, go and find golden balls, as you can see in the poster in this series poster, just like Goku does in, in Dragon Ball as well. So these are two um, Japan and uh, Japanese and Korean um, popular um, shows um, that respectively are derived in parts from Journey to the West. And another myth, just in passing, that you will no doubt have heard of is that of Mulan, which, again, if not based on as uh, historically attested a historical figure as in Journey to the West, the legend indeed uh, of a woman or a, a girl who serves as a man uh, in the army um, in, instead of her father goes back to um, 
the medieval Chinese period. And indeed, the story itself is set in the Northern Wei Dynasty, one of the um, uh, northern states of China, after the collapse of the Han Dynasty around 200 CE, that was controlled by non-Chinese people. So you see this depiction of uh, that legendary figure of Mulan, and we have poems from the medieval period, uh, a, a number of poems describing that story, the Ballad of Mulan. And then the ones you'll know, of course, are the two um, Disney versions, one from 1998, this animated film, very popular, big success. And somewhat less successful, maybe a lot less successful, the 2020 um, movie version, despite its star power and huge budget, uh, it wasn't just because of COVID that it didn't do as well as it might have done, um, both um, worldwide uh, and in China, where it was um, criticized to an extent, in part because of this character, these kind of um, enchantress kind of witch character, who is is an addition, some, some many feel, um, that was um, perhaps unwanted or unnecessary and warranted. But in any case, this is a great example of um, a myth, a legend that has been spun over centuries from medieval China to now audiences uh, across the world, um, thanks to um, Disney. So then, uh, I hope you got a sense from this taster lecture of what we have to offer through our modules at SOAS. So this one is on East Asian myths. And as you can see, it's a big topic, a very rich topic um, that in a sense, you know, we were only um, scratching the surface of this huge topic as, as that's what we is possible to do in a 10 week module. But we do offer great breadth um, into a very important topic, East Asian culture and also depth. So you get the breadth through the themes, um, this range of themes and from the lectures uh, and from the readings, but you are able to um, go in depth in your own study uh, of uh, some of these myths through writing a short essay or a reaction paper on one of the readings that go along with one of these week's lectures, as well as uh, writing uh, a myth study, uh, a topic of your own. And, you know, we, uh, in the just the couple of years that we've offered this course already, it's quite a new module. I've read many, many great papers and covering all kinds of topics, uh, including some of the ones I uh, mentioned, like um, Fox Spirit uh, legends from traditional times to the present, to TV shows and movies. Um, I have a student who's currently researching um, the mythology, Chinese, myth Chinese mythology of uh, the Shang-Chi movie, the Marvel movie. Uh, a big fan of Dragon Ball, who's written a very good paper on um, the many influences of the journey to the West on Dragon Ball. So as you can see then, it's a great course, lots of things going on, lots of ideas, lots of myths to think about, and we really encourage students to write on something that um, grabs your attention and uh, that you'll enjoy. So thanks very much and hope to see you uh, here in this course or otherwise. Thank you.